The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien Book One, The Fellowship of the Ring Chapter One, A Long-Expected Party When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11-1st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. Bilbo was very rich and very peculiar, and had been the wonder of the Shire for sixty years, ever since his remarkable disappearance and unexpected return. The riches he had brought back from his travels had now become a local legend, and it was popularly believed, whatever the old folk might say, that the hill at Bag End was full of tunnels stuffed with treasure. And if that was not enough for fame, there was also his prolonged vigour to marvel at. Time wore on, but it seemed to have little effect on Mr. Baggins. At ninety, he was much the same as fifty. At ninety-nine, they began to call him well-preserved, but unchanged would have been nearer the mark. There were some that shook their heads and thought this was too much of a good thing. It seemed unfair that anyone should possess, apparently, perpetual youth, as well as, reputedly, inexhaustible wealth. "'It'll have to be paid for,' they said. "'It isn't natural, and trouble will come of it.' But so far, trouble had not come, and as Mr. Baggins was generous with his money, most people were willing to forgive him his oddities and his good fortune. He remained on visiting terms with his relatives, except, of course, the Sackville Bagginses, and he had many devoted admirers among the hobbits of poor and unimportant families. But he had no close friends, until some of his younger cousins began to grow up. The eldest of these, and Bilbo's favourite, was young Frodo Baggins. When Bilbo was ninety-nine, he adopted Frodo as his heir and brought him to live at Bag End, and the hopes of the Sackville Bagginses were finally dashed. Bilbo and Frodo happened to have the same birthday, September the 22nd. You had better come and live here, Rhoda, my lad, said Bilbo one day, and then we can celebrate our birthday parties comfortably together. At that time, Frodo was still in his tweens, as the hobbits called the irresponsible twenties between childhood and coming of age at thirty-three. Twelve more years passed. Each year the Bagginses had given very lively combined birthday parties at Bag End, but now it was understood that something quite exceptional was being planned for that autumn. Bilbo was going to be eleventy-one. One, one, one. A rather curious number, and a very respectable age for a hobbit. The old Tuke himself had only reached one hundred thirty. And Frodo was going to be thirty-three. Three, three. An important number. The date of his coming of age. Tongues began to wag in Hobbiton and Bywater, and rumour of the coming event travelled all over the Shire. The history and character of Mr. Bilbo Baggins became once again the chief topic of conversation, and the older folk suddenly found their reminiscences in welcome demand. No one had a more attentive audience than old Ham Gamgee, commonly known as the Gaffer. He held forth at the Ivy Bush, a small inn on the Bywater Road, and he spoke with some authority, for he had tended the garden at Bag End for forty years and had helped old Holman in the same job before that. Now that he was himself growing old and stiff in the joints, the job was mainly carried on by his youngest son, Sam Gamgee. Both father and son were on very friendly terms with Bilbo and Frodo. They lived on the hill itself, in number three, Bagshot Row, just below Bag End. A very nice, well-spoken, gentle hobbit is Mr. Bilbo, as I've always said, the gaffer declared with perfect truth, for Bilbo was very polite to him, calling him Master Hamfast, and consulting him constantly upon the growing of vegetables in the matter of roots, especially potatoes. The gaffer was recognised as the leading authority by all in the neighbourhood, including himself. But what about this Frodo that lives with him? asked old Noakes of Bywater. Maggins is his name, but he's more than half a brandy buck, they say. It beats me why any baggage in Hobbiton should go looking for a wife away there in Buckland. Where folks are so queer. And no wonder they're queer, put in Daddy Twofoot, 
the gaffer's next door neighbor. If they live on the wrong side of the Brandywine River and right again the old forest, that's a dark place if half the tales be true. You're right then, said the gaffer. Not that the Brandy Bucks of Buckland live in the old forest. They're a queer breed, seemingly. They fall about with boats on that big river, and that's that is a natural. Small wonder that trouble came of it, I say. But be that as it may, Mr. Frodo is as nice a young hobbit as you could wish to meet. Very much like Mr. Bilbo. And in more than looks. After all, his father was a Baggins. A decent, respectable hobbit was Mr. Drogo Baggins. Well, there never was much to tell of him. Till he was drowned. Drowned? <laughs> said several voices. They had heard this and other darker rumours before, of course, but hobbits have a passion for family history, and they were ready to hear it again. Well, so they say, said the gaffer. You see, Mr. Drogo, he married poor Miss Primula Brandybuck. She was our Mr. Bilbo's first cousin on her mother's side, or her mother being the youngest of the old Duke's daughters, and Mr. Drogo was his second cousin, so Mr. Frodo is his first and second cousin once removed either way, as the saying is, if you follow me. And Mr. Drogo was staying at Brandy Hall with his father-in-law, old Master Gorbadoc, as he often did after his marriage, him being partial to his victuals, uh, and old Gorbadoc keeping a mighty generous table. And he went out boating on the Brandywine River, and he and his wife were drowned, and Poor Mr. Frodo, only a child and all. I've heard they went on the water after dinner in the moonlight, said old Noakes. And it was Drogo's weight that sunk the boat. And I heard she pushed him in. And he pulled her in after him, said Sandyman, the Hobbit and Miller. You shouldn't listen to all you hear, Sandyman, said the gaffer, who did not much like the Miller. There is no call to go talking of pushing and pulling. Boats are quite tricky enough for those that sit still without looking further for the cause of trouble. Anyway, there was this Mr. Frodo left an orphan and stranded, as you might say, among those queer booklanders. Being brought up anyhow in Brandy Hole, a regular warren by all accounts. Old Master Gorbadoc never had fewer than a couple of hundred relations in the place. Uh, Mr. Bilbo never did a kinder deed than when he brought the lad back to live among decent folk. <laughs> but I reckon it was a nasty shock for those Sackville Bagginses. <laughs> they thought they were going to get back again that time when he went off and was thought to be dead. And then he comes back and orders them off. <laughs> and goes on living and living and never looking a day older, bless him. <laughs> and suddenly he produces an heir. And as all the papers made up proper, the Sackville Bagginses won't ever see them inside a bag in now. <laughs> or it is to be hoped not. There's a tidy bit of money tucked away up there, I hear tell, said a stranger, a visitor on business from Mikkel Delving in the West Farthing. Oh, the top of your hill is full of tunnels packed with chests of gold and silver and jewels by what I've heard. Then you've heard more than I could speak to, answered the gaffer. I know nothing about jewels. Mr. Pilpo's free with his money, and there seems no lack of it, but I know of no tunnel making. I saw Mr. Pilpo when he came back. A matter of sixty years ago, when I was a lad, I'd not long come apprentice to old Holman, him being my dad's cousin, but he had me up at Baggown, helping him to keep folks from trampling and traipsing all over the garden while the sale was on. And in the middle of it all, Mr. Bilbo comes up the hill with a pony, and some mighty big bags and a couple of chests. I don't doubt they were mostly full of treasure he had picked up in foreign parts, where there be mountains of gold, they say. But there wasn't enough to fill tunnels. But my lad Sam, we'll know more about that. He's in and out of Bag End. <laughs> Crazy about stories of the old days he is. And he listens to all Mr. Bilbo's tales. Mr. Bilbo has learned him his letters, meaning no harm, mark you, and I hope no harm will come of it. Hells and dragons, I says to him. Cabbages and potatoes are better for me and you. Don't go getting mixed up in the business of your betters, or you'll land in trouble too big for you, I says to him. And I might say it to others, he added with a look at the stranger and the miller. But the gaffer did not convince his audience. 
The legend of Bilbo's wealth was now too firmly fixed in the minds of the younger generation of hobbits. Ah, but he has likely enough been added to what he brought at first, argued the miller, voicing common opinion. He's often away from home. And look at the outlandish folk that visit him. Dwarves coming at night, and that old wandering conjurer, Gandalf and all. You can say what you like, Gaffer, but Bag End's a queer place. And it folk are queerer. And you can say what you like about what you know no more than you do at Bolton, Mr. Sandy. Hmm. Retorted the gaffer, disliking the miller even more than usual. <laughs> if that's being queer, then we could do with a bit more queerness in these parts. There's some not far away that wouldn't offer a pint of beer to a friend if they lived in a hole of golden walls. But they do things proper at Bag End. Our Sam said that everyone's going to be invited to the party. And there's going to be presents, mark you. Presents for all. This very month, as is. Huh. That very month was September. And as fine as you could ask. A day or two later, a rumor, probably started by the knowledgeable Sam, was spread about that there were going to be fireworks. Fireworks, what is more, such as had not been seen in the Shire for nigh on a century. Not indeed since the old Duke died. Days passed, and the day drew nearer. An odd-looking wagon, laden with odd-looking packages, rolled into Hobbiton one evening and toiled up the hill to Bag End. The startled hobbits peered out of lamplit doors to gape at it. It was driven by outlandish folk, singing strange songs. Dwarves with long beards and deep woods. A few of them remained at Bag End. At the end of the second week in September, a cart came in through Bywater from the direction of the Brandywine Bridge in broad daylight. An old man was driving it all alone. He wore a tall, pointed blue hat, a long grey cloak and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and bushy eyebrows that stuck out beyond the brim of his hat. Small hobbit children ran after the cart all through Hobbiton and right up the hill. It had a cargo of fireworks, as they rightly guessed. At Bilbo's front door, the old man began to unload. There were great bundles of fireworks of all sorts and shapes, each labelled with a large red Fionorian G and the elf rune G. That was Gandalf's mark, of course, and the old man was Gandalf the wizard whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the Shire folk knew nothing about it. To them, he was just one of the attractions at the party, hence the excitement of the Hobbit children. G for grand, they shouted, and the old man smiled. They knew him by sight, though he only appeared in Hobbiton occasionally and never stopped long. But neither they nor any but the oldest of their elders had seen one of his firework displays. They now belonged to the legendary past. When the old man, helped by Bilbo and some dwarves, had finished unloading, Bilbo gave a few pennies away, but not a single squib or cracker was forthcoming, to the disappointment of the onlookers. Run away now, said Gandalf, or you will get plenty when the time comes. Then he disappeared inside with Bilbo, and the door was shut. The young hobbit stared at the door in vain for a while, and then made off, feeling that the day of the party would never come. Inside Bag End, Bilbo and Gandalf were sitting at the open window of a small room looking out west onto the garden. The late afternoon was bright and peaceful. The flowers glowed red and golden, Snapdragons and sunflowers and nasturtiums trailing all over the turf walls and peeping in at the round windows. <laughs> How bright your garden looks, said Gandalf. Yes, said Bilbo. I am very fond indeed of it, and of all the dear old Shire. But I think I need a holiday. You mean to go on with your plan then? I do. I made up my mind months ago, and I... and I haven't changed it. Very well. It is no good saying any more. Stick to your plan. Your whole plan, mind. And I hope it will turn out for the best. For you, and for all of us. I hope so. 
Anyway, I mean to enjoy myself on Thursday and have my little joke. Who will laugh, I wonder? said Gandalf, shaking his head. <clears throat> we shall see, said Bilbo. The next day, more carts rolled up the hill. And still more carts. There might have been some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week, orders began to pour out of Bag End for every kind of provision, commodity or luxury that could be obtained in Hobbiton or Bywater or anywhere in the neighborhood. People became enthusiastic, and they began to tick off the days on the calendar, and they watched eagerly for the postman, hoping for invitations. Before long, the invitations began pouring out, and the Hobbiton post office was blocked, and the Bywater post office was snowed under and voluntary assistant postmen were called for. There was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on, thank you, I shall certainly come. A notice appeared on the gate at Bag End. No admittance except on party business. Even those who had, or pretended to have party business, were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy, writing invitations, ticking off answers, packing up presents and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival, he remained hidden from view. One morning, the hobbits woke to find the large field south of Bilbo's front door, covered with ropes and poles for tents and pavilions. A special entrance was cut into the bank leading to the road, and wide steps and a large white gate were built there. And there, the three hobbit families of Bagshot Row adjoining the field were intensely interested and generally envied. Old Gaffer Gamgee stopped even pretending to work in his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion, so big that the tree that grew in the field was right inside it and stood proudly near one end, at the head of the chief table. Lanterns were hung on all its branches. More promising still, to the hobbit's mind, an enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field. A draft of cooks from every inn and eating house for miles around arrived to supplement the dwarves and other odd folk that were quartered at Bag End. Excitement rose to its height. Then the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday, the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. Then Thursday, September the 22nd, actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled, and the fun began. Bilbo Baggins called it a party, but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there were even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests and additions at the new White Gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The latter were those who went out again by a back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion. But it was not a bad system. Actually, in Hobbiton and Bywater, every day in the year, it was somebody's birthday, so that every hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week. But they never got tired of them. On this occasion, the presents were unusually good. The hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. There were toys the like of which they had never seen before, all beautiful, and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before, and had come all the way from the mountain, and from Dale, and were of real dwarf make. When every guest had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times, there were merely lots of people eating and drinking, continuously from 11 seas until 6.30, when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him. And the special effects, set pieces and flights of rockets were let off by him. 
but there was also a generous distribution of squibs, crackers, backer wrappers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. Their leaves opened like a whole spring unfolding in a moment, and their shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that flew, glittering into the trees. There were pillars of coloured fires that rose and turned into eagles, or sailing ships, or a phalanx of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army, and came down again into the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise. In honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly, as Gandalf intended. The lights went out. A great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain seen in the distance, and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon, not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from its jaws, its eyes glared down, there was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turned a somersault, and burst over by water with a deafening explosion. That is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leapt to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone. For everyone, that is, except those invited to the special family dinner party. This was held in the great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross, though the word was not considered proper to use of people. And their guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related with the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many young hobbits were included, and present by parental permission, for hobbits were easy going with their children in the matter of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. Bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many bagginses and boffins, and also many tooks and brandy bucks. There were various grubs, relations of Bilbo Baggins' grandmother, and various chubs, connections of his chook grandfather, and a selection of burroses, bulges, brace girders, brockhouses, good bodies, horn blowers, and proudfuls. Some of these were only very distantly connected with Bilbo, and some of them had hardly ever been in Hobbiton before, as they lived in remote corners of the Shire. The Sackville Bagginses were not forgotten. Otho and his wife Lobelia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Frodo. But so magnificent was the invitation card, written with golden ink, that they had felt it was impossible to refuse. Besides, their cousin, Bilbo, had been specialising in food for many years, and his table had a high reputation. All the 144 guests expected a pleasant feast, though they rather dreaded the after-dinner speech of their host, an inevitable item. He was liable to drag in bits of what he called poetry, and sometimes after a glass or two, would allude to the absurd adventures of his mysterious journey. The guests were not disappointed. They had a very pleasant feast. In fact, an engrossing entertainment, rich, abundant, varied, and prolonged. The purchase of provisions fell almost to nothing throughout the district in the ensuing weeks. But as Bilbo's catering had depleted the stocks of most stores, cellars, and warehouses for miles around, that did not matter much. After the feast, more or less, came the speech. Most of the company were, however, now in a tolerant mood, at that delightful stage which they called filling up the corners. They were sipping their favourite drinks, and nibbling at their favourite dainties, and their fears were forgotten. They were prepared to listen to anything, and to cheer at every full stop. 
My dear people, began Bilbo, rising in his place. Hear, 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 they shouted, and kept on repeating it in chorus, seeming reluctant to follow their own advice. Bilbo left his place and went and stood on a chair under the illuminated tree. The light of the lanterns fell on his beaming face. The golden buttons shone on his embroidered silk waistcoat. They could all see him standing, waving one hand in the air, the other was in his trouser pocket. My dear Bagginses and Boffins! He began again. And my dear Tooks and Brandybucks! And Grubs! And Chubs! And Bellowses! And Horn Blowers! And Bulgers! Brace Girdles! Good Bodies! Brockhouses! And Proudfoots! Proud feet! shouted an elderly hobbit from the back of the pavilion. His name, of course, was Proudfoot, and well merited. His feet were large, exceptionally furry, and both were on the table. Proudfoots, repeated Bilbo. Also, my good Sackville Bagginses that I welcome back at last to Bag End. Today is my 111th birthday. I am 111 today. Hooray! Hooray! Many happy returns, they shouted. And they hammered joyously on the tables. Bilbo was doing splendidly. This was the sort of stuff they liked. Short and obvious. I hope you're all enjoying yourselves as much as I am. Deafening cheers. Cries of yes and no. Noises of trumpets and horns, pipes and flutes, and other musical instruments. There were, as has been said, many young hobbits present. Hundreds of musical crackers had been pulled. Most of them bore the mark Bale on them, which did not convey much to most of the hobbits, but they all agreed they were marvellous crackers. They contained instruments, small but of perfect make, and enchanting tones. Indeed, in one corner, some of the young Tukes and Brandybucks, supposing Uncle Bilbo to have finished, since he had plainly said all that was necessary, now got up an impromptu orchestra and began a merry dance tune. Master Everard Duke and Miss Mellilock Brandybuck got on the table and with bells in their hands began to dance the Springle Ring. A pretty dance, but rather vigorous. But Bilbo had not finished. Seizing a horn from a youngster nearby, he blew three loud hoots. The noise subsided. I shall not keep you long! He cried. Cheers from all the assembly. I have called you all together. For a purpose. Something in the way that he said this made an impression. There was almost silence. And one or two of the Tukes pricked up their ears. Indeed, for three purposes. First of all, to tell you that I am immensely fond of you all and that eleventy-one years is too short a time to live among such excellent and admirable hobbits. Tremendous outburst of approval. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. This was unexpected and rather difficult. There was some scattered clapping, but most of them were trying to work it out and see if it came to a compliment. Secondly, to celebrate my birthday. Cheers again. I should say our birthday, for it is, of course, also the birthday of my heir and nephew, Frodo. He comes of age and into his inheritance today. Some perfunctory clapping from the elders and some loud shouts of Frodo, Frodo, jolly old Frodo from the juniors. The Sackville Bagginses scowled and wondered what was meant by coming into his inheritance. Together, we score 144. Your numbers were chosen to fit this remarkable total. One gross, if I may use the expression. No cheers. This was ridiculous. Many of his guests, and especially the Sackville Bagginses, were insulted, feeling sure they had only been asked to fill up the required number, like goods in a package. Von Gross indeed. Vulgar expression. It is also, if I may be allowed to refer to ancient history, the anniversary of my arrival by Beryl at Esgaroth on the Long Lake. 
Though the fact that it was my birthday slipped my memory on that occasion. I was only 51 then, and birthdays did not seem so important. The banquet was very splendid, however, though I had a bad cold at the time, I remember, and could only say, Thank you very much. I now repeat it more correctly. Thank you very much for coming to my little party. Obstinate silence. They all feared that the song, or some poetry, was now imminent, and they were getting bored. Why couldn't he stop talking and let them drink his health? But Bilbo did not sing or recite. He paused for a moment. Thirdly and finally, he said, I wish to make an announcement! He spoke this last word so loudly and suddenly that everyone sat up who still could. I regret to announce that, though, as I said, 11 years is far too short a time to spend among you. This is the end. I am going. I am leaving now. Goodbye. He stepped down and vanished. There was a blinding flash of light, and the guests all blinked. When they opened their eyes, Bilbo was nowhere to be seen. One hundred and forty-four flabbergasted hobbits sat speechless. Old Dodo Proudfoot removed his feet from the table and stamped. Then there was a dead silence. Until suddenly, after several deep breaths, every Baggins, Boffin, Tube, Brandybuck, Grub, Chub, Burrows, Bulger, Bracegirdle, Brockhouse, Good Body, Hornblower, and Proudfoot began to talk at once. It was generally agreed that the joke was in very bad taste, and more food and drink were needed to cure guests of shock and annoyance. He's mad, I always said so, was probably the most popular comment. Even the Tukes, with a few exceptions, thought Bilbo's behavior was absurd. For the moment, most of them took it for granted that his disappearance was nothing more than a ridiculous prank. But old Rory Brandybuck was not so sure. Neither age nor an enormous dinner had clouded his wits and he said to his daughter-in-law, Esmeralda, There's something fishy in this, my dear. I believe that mad Baggins is off again. <laughs> Silly old fool, but why worry? He hasn't taken the vittles with him. He called loudly to Frodo to send the wine round again. Frodo was the only one present who had said nothing. For some time he had sat silent beside Bilbo's empty chair and ignored all remarks and questions. He had enjoyed the joke, of course, even though he had been in the know. He had difficulty in keeping from laughter at the indignant surprise of the guests, but at the same time, he felt deeply troubled. He realized suddenly that he loved the old hobbit dearly. Most of the guests went on eating and drinking, and discussing Bilbo Baggins' oddities, past and present, but the Sackville Bagginses had already departed in wrath. Frodo did not want to have any more to do with the party. He gave orders for more wine to be served. Then he got up and drained his own glass silently, to the health of Bilbo, and slipped out of the pavilion. As for Bilbo Baggins, even while he was making his speech, he had been fingering the golden ring in his pocket, his magic ring that he had kept secret for so many years. As he stepped down, he slipped it on his finger and he was never seen by any hobbit in Hobbiton again. He walked briskly back to his home and stood for a moment listening with a smile to the din in the pavilion and to the sounds of merrymaking in other parts of the field. Then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up and wrapped in tissue paper his embroidered silk waistcoat and put it away. Then he put on quickly some old untidy garments and fastened round his waist a worn leather belt. On it he hung a short sword in a battered black leather scabbard. From a locked drawer, smelling of old mothballs, he took out an old cloak and hood. They had been locked up as if they were very precious. But they were so patched and weather-stained that their original color could hardly be guessed. It might have been dark green. They were rather too large for him. He then went into his study, and from a large strong box, took out a bundle wrapped in old cloths, and a leather-bound manuscript, and also a large bulky envelope. The book and bundle he stuffed into the top of a heavy bag that was standing there, already nearly full. Into the envelope he slipped his golden ring, and its fine chain, and then sealed it, and addressed it to Frodo. At first he put it on the mantelpiece, but suddenly he removed it and stuck it in his pocket. 
At that moment, the door opened and Gandalf came quickly in. Oh! Hello, said Bilbo. I wondered if you would turn up. I am glad to find you visible, replied the wizard, sitting down in a chair. I wanted to catch you and have a few final words. I suppose you feel that everything has gone off splendidly and according to plan? Yes, I do, said Bilbo. Though that flash was surprising. It quite startled me, let alone the others. A little addition of your own, I suppose? It was. You have wisely kept the ring secret all these years. And it seemed to me necessary to give your guests something else that would seem to explain your sudden vanishment. Pain would spoil my joke. <laughs> oh, you are an interfering old busybody, <laughs> laughed Bilbo. <laughs> but I expect you know best, as usual. I do, when I know anything. But I don't feel too sure about this whole affair. It has now come to the final point. You've had your joke and alarmed or offended most of your relations, and given the whole Shire something to talk about for nine days, or ninety-nine more likely. Are you going any further? Yes, I am. I feel I need a holiday. A very long holiday, as I have told you before. Probably a permanent holiday. I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I don't mean to, and I have made all arrangements. I am old, Gandalf. I don't look it, but I'm beginning to feel it in my heart of hearts. Well preserved indeed, he snorted. Why, I feel all thin, sort of stretched, if you know what I mean. Like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. I can't be right. I need a change, or something. Gandalf looked curiously and closely at him. No, it does not seem right, he said thoughtfully. No, after all, I believe your plan is probably the best. Well, I've made up my mind anyway. I want to see mountains again, Gandalf. Mountains! And then find somewhere where I can rest. In peace and quiet without a lot of relatives prying around and a string of confounded visitors hanging on the bell. I might find somewhere where I can finish my book. I have thought of a nice ending for it. And he lived happily ever after, to the end of his days. Gandalf <laughs> laughed. <laughs> I hope he will. But nobody will read the book however it ends. Oh, they may in years to come. Frodo has read some already, as far as it has gone. You'll keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes. As often as I can spare them. <laughs> he would come with me, of course, if I asked him. In fact, he offered to once, just before the party. But he does not really want to yet. I want to see the wild country again before I die. And the mountains. But he is still in love with the Shire. With the woods and the fields and little rivers. He ought to be comfortable here. I am leaving everything to him, of course, except a few oddments. I hope he will be happy when he gets used to being on his own. It's time he was his own master now. Everything, said Gandalf. The ring as well. You agreed to that, you remember? Well, uh, yes, I, I suppose so, stammered Bilbo. Where is it? In an envelope, if you must know, said Bilbo impatiently. There, on the mantelpiece. Well, no. Here it is in my pocket, he hesitated. <laughs> Isn't that odd now, he said softly to himself. Yet after all, why not? Why shouldn't it stay there? Gandalf looked again very hard at Bilbo, and there was a gleam in his eyes. I think, Bilbo, he said quietly, I should leave it behind. Don't you want to? Well, yes. Uh, and no. Now it comes to it, I, I don't feel like parting with it at all, I might say. And I don't really see why I should. Why do you want me to? He asked, and a curious change came over his voice. It was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. You, you are always badgering me about my ring, but you have never bothered me about the other things that I got on my journey. No, but I had to badger you, said Gandalf. I wanted the truth. 
It was important. Magic rings are, well, magical, and they are rare and curious. I was professionally interested in your ring, you may say, and I still am. I should like to know where it is if you go wandering again. Also, I think you have had it quite long enough. You don't need it anymore, Bilbo, unless I am quite mistaken. Bilbo flushed, and there was an angry light in his eyes. His kindly face grew hard. Why not? He cried. And what business is it of yours anyway to know what I do with my own things? It is my own. I found it. It came to me. Yes, yes, said Gandalf. There is no need to get angry. If I am angry, it is your fault, said Bilbo. It is mine, I tell you. My own. My precious. Yes, my precious. The wizard's face remained grave and attentive, and only a flicker in his deep eyes showed that he was startled and indeed alarmed. It has been called that before, he said. But not by you. But I say it now, and why not? Even if Gollum said the same once, it's not his now, but mine. I shall keep it, I say. Gandalf stood up. He spoke sternly. You will be a fool if you do, Bilbo, he said. You make that clearer in every word you say. It has got far too much hold on you. Let it go, and then you can go yourself and be free. I'll do as I choose and go as I please, said Bilbo obstinately. Now, now, my dear hobbit, said Gandalf. All your long life we have been friends, and you owe me something. Come, do as you promised. Give it up. Well, if you want my ring yourself, say so, cried Bilbo. But she won't get it. I won't give my precious away, I tell you. His hand strayed to the hilt of his small sword. Gandalf's eyes flashed. It will be my turn to get angry soon, he said. If you say that again, I shall. Then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the hobbit, and he seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Bilbo backed away to the wall, breathing hard, his hand clutching at his pocket. They stood for a while facing one another, and the air of the room tingled. Gandalf's eyes remained bent on the hobbit. Slowly, his hands relaxed, and he began to tremble. I don't know what has come over you, Gandalf, he said. You have never been like this before. What is it all about? It is mine, isn't it? I found it. And Gollum would have killed me if I hadn't kept it. I'm not a thief, whatever he said. I have never called you one, Gandalf answered. And I am not one either. I'm not trying to rob you, but to help you. I wish you would trust me as you use. He turned away and the shadow passed. He seemed to dwindle again into an old grey man, bent and troubled. Bilbo drew his hand over his eyes. I'm sorry, he said. But I felt so queer. And it would be a relief in a way not to be bothered with it anymore. It has been so growing on my mind lately. Sometimes I have felt it was like an eye looking at me. And I'm always wanting to put it on and disappear, don't you know? <laughs> Wondering if it is safe. And pulling it out to make sure. I, I tried locking it up, but I found I couldn't rest without it in my pocket. I don't know why, and I don't seem able to make up my mind. Then trust mine, said Gandalf. It is quite made up. Go away and leave it behind. Stop possessing it. Give it to Frodo, and I will look after him. Bilbo stood for a moment tense and undecided. Presently he sighed. <sighs> All right, he said with an effort. I will. Then he shrugged his shoulders and smiled rather ruefully. <laughs> after all, that's what this party business was all about, really. To give away lots of birthday presents, and somehow make it easier to give it away at the same time. It hasn't made it any easier in the end, but it would be a pity to waste all my preparations. It would quite spoil the joke. Indeed, it would take away the only point I ever saw in the affair, said Gandalf. <laughs> Very well, said Bilbo. He goes to Frodo. With all the rest. He drew a deep breath. And now I really must be starting or someone else will catch me. I have said goodbye, and I couldn't bear to do it all over again. He picked up his bag and moved to the door. You have still got the ring in your pocket, said the wizard. Oh, well, so I have, cried Bilbo. And with my will and all the other documents, too. Oh, you, you had better take it and deliver it for me. 
That will be safest. No, don't give the ring to me, said Gandalf. Put it on the mantelpiece. It will be safe enough there till Frodo comes. I shall wait for him. Bilbo took out the envelope, but just as he was about to set it by the clock, his hand jerked back, and the packet fell on the floor. Before he could pick it up, the wizard stooped and seized it and set it in its place. A spasm of anger passed swiftly over the hobbit's face again. Suddenly it gave way to a look of relief and a laugh. (laughs) Well, that's that, he said. Now, I'm off. They went out into the hall. Bilbo chose his favorite stick from the stand, and then he whistled. Three dwarves came out of different rooms where they had been busy. Is everything ready? asked Bilbo. Everything packed and labeled? Everything, Everything, they answered. Well, let's start then. He stepped out of the front door. It was a fine night, and the black sky was dotted with stars. He looked up, sniffing the air. What fun! What fun to be off again, off on the road with dwarves. This is what I've really been longing for, for years. Goodbye, he said, looking at his old home and bowing to the door. Goodbye, Gandalf. Goodbye for the present, Bilbo. Take care of yourself. You are old enough, and perhaps wise enough. Take care. I don't care. Don't you worry about me. I'm as happy now as I have ever been, and that is saying a great deal. But the time has come. I'm being swept off my feet at last, he added, and then in a low voice, as if to himself, he sang softly in the dark. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet, until it joins some larger way, where many paths and errands meet, and whither then I cannot say. He paused, silent for a moment. Then without another word, He turned away from the lights and voices in the fields and tents, and followed by his three companions, went round into his garden, and trotted down the long sloping path. He jumped over a low place in the hedge at the bottom, and took to the meadows, passing into the night like a rustle of wind in the grass. Gandalf remained for a while staring after him into the darkness. Goodbye, my dear Bilbo. Until our next meeting. He said softly and went back indoors. Frodo came in soon afterwards and found him sitting in the dark, deep in thought. Has he gone? He asked. Yes, answered Gandalf. He has gone at last. I wish. I mean, I hoped until this evening that it was only a joke, said Frodo. But I knew in my heart that he really meant to go. He always used to joke about serious things. I wish I'd come back sooner, just to see him off. I think really he preferred slipping off quietly in the end, said Gandalf. Don't be too troubled. He'll be all right. Now, he left a packet for you. There it is. Frodo took the envelope from the mantelpiece and glanced at it, but did not open it. You'll find his will and all other documents in there, I think, said the wizard. You are the master of Bag End now. And also, I fancy, you will find a golden ring. The ring! exclaimed Frodo. Has he left me that? Wonder why. Still, may be useful. It may, and it may not, said Gandalf. I should not make use of it if I were you, but keep it secret and keep it safe. Now, I am going to bed. As master of Bag End, Frodo felt it his painful duty to say goodbye to the guests. Rumours of strange events had by now spread all over the field, but Frodo would only say, No doubt everything will be cleared up in the morning. About midnight, carriages came for the important folk. One by one they rolled away, filled with full but very unsatisfied hobbits. Gardeners came by arrangement, and removed in wheelbarrows those that had inadvertently remained behind. Night slowly passed. The sun rose. The hobbits rose rather later. Morning went on. People came and began by orders to clear away the pavilions and the tables and the chairs, 
and the spoons and knives and bottles and plates and the lanterns and the flowering shrubs and boxes and the crumbs and cracker paper, the forgotten bags and gloves and handkerchiefs and the uneaten food, a very small item. Then a number of other people came without orders. Bagginses and boffins and bulgers and toques and other guests that lived or were staying near. By midday, when even the best fed were out and about again, there was a large crowd at Bag End, uninvited, but not unexpected. Frodo was waiting on the step, smiling but looking rather tired and worried. He welcomed all the callers, but he had not much more to say than before. His reply to all inquiries was simply this. Mr. Bilbo Baggins has gone away, as far as I know, for good. Some of the visitors he invited to come inside as Bilbo had left messages for them. Inside in the hall there was piled a large assortment of packages and parcels and small articles of furniture. On every item was a label tied. There were several labels of this sort. For Adelard Tuke, for his very own, from Bilbo, on an umbrella. Adelard had carried off many unlabeled ones. For Dora Baggins, in memory of a long correspondence, with love from Bilbo, on a large waste paper basket. Dora was Drogo's sister and the eldest surviving female relative of Bilbo and Frodo. She was 99 and had written reams of good advice for more than half a century. For Milo Burrows, hoping it will be useful from BB. On a gold pen and ink bottle, Milo never answered letters. For Angelica's use, from Uncle Bilbo. On a round convex mirror, she was a young Baggins, and two obviously considered her face shapely. For the collection of Hugo Brace Girdle, from a contributor. On an empty bookcase, Hugo was a great borrower of books, and worse than usual at returning them. For Lobelia Sackville Baggins, as a present, on a case of silver spoons. Bilbo believed that she had acquired a good many of his spoons while he was away on his former journey. Lobelia knew that quite well. When she arrived later in the day, she took the point at once. But she also took the spoons. This is only a small selection of the assembled presents. Bilbo's residence had got rather cluttered up with things in the course of his long life. It was a tendency of hobbit holes to get cluttered up, for which the custom of giving so many birthday presents was largely responsible. Not, of course, that the birthday presents were always new. They were one or two old mathems of forgotten uses that had circulated all around the district. But Bilbo had usually given new presents and kept those that he received. The old hole was now being cleared a little. Every one of the various parting gifts had labels written out personally by Bilbo. And several had some point or some joke. But of course, most of the things were given where they would be wanted and welcome. The poorer hobbits, and especially those of Backshot Row, did very well. Old Gaffer Ganji got two sacks of potatoes, a new spade, a woolen waistcoat, and a bottle of ointment for creaking joints. Old Rory Brandybuck, in return for much hospitality, got a dozen bottles of old vineyards, a strong red wine from the South Farthing, and now quite mature, as it had been laid down by Bilbo's father. Rory quite forgave Bilbo and voted him a capital fellow after the first bottle. There was plenty of everything left for Frodo, and of course all the chief treasures as well as the books, pictures, and more than enough furniture were left in his possession. There was, however, no sign nor mention of money or jewellery. Not a penny piece or a glass bead was given away. Frodo had a very trying time that afternoon. A false rumour that the whole household was being distributed free spread like wildfire, and before long the place was packed with people who had no business there, but could not be kept out. Labels got torn off and mixed, and quarrels broke out. Some people tried to do swaps and deals in the hall, and others tried to make off with minor items not addressed to them or with anything that seemed unwanted or unwatched. The road to the gate was blocked with barrows and handcarts. In the middle of the commotion, the Sackville Bagginses arrived. Frodo had retired for a while and left his friend Mary Brandybuck to keep an eye on things. When Otho loudly demanded to see Frodo, Mary bowed politely. He is indisposed, he said. He is resting. Hiding you been, said Lobelia. Anyway, we want to see him, and we mean to see him. Just go and tell him so. Mary left them a long while in the hall, and they had time to discover their parting gift of spoons. It did not improve their tempers. Eventually, they were shown into the study. Frodo was sitting at a table with a lot of papers in front of him. He looked indisposed, 
to see the sack of baggages at any rate. And he stood up, fidgeting with something in his pocket. But he spoke quite politely. The Sackville Bagginses were rather offensive. They began by offering him bad bargain prices, as between friends, or various valuables and unlabeled things. When Frodo replied that only the things especially directed by Bilbo were being given away, they said the whole affair was very fishy. Only one thing is clear to me, said Otho, and that is that you're doing a seedily well out of it. I insist on seeing the will. Otho would have been Bilbo's heir, but for the adoption of Frodo. He read the will carefully and snorted. It was unfortunately very clear and correct, according to the legal customs of hobbits, which demand, among other things, seven signatures of witnesses in red ink. <laughs> Foiled again, he said to his wife. And after waiting sixty years, spoons, fiddlesticks. He snapped his fingers under Frodo's nose and stumped off. But Lobelia was not so easily got rid of. A little later, Frodo came out of the study to see how things were going on and found her still about the place, investigating nooks and corners and tapping the floors. He escorted her firmly off the premises after he had relieved her of several small but rather valuable articles that had somehow fallen inside her umbrella. Her face looked as if she was in the throes of thinking out a really crushing parting remark, but all she found to say, turning round on the step, was, You'll live to regret it, young fellow. Why didn't you go too? You don't belong here. You're no Baggins. You... You're a brandy buck. Did you hear that, Mary? That was an insult, if you like. Said Frodo as he shut the door on her. Oh. I was a compliment, said Mary Brandybuck. And so, of course, not true. Then they went round the hole and evicted three young hobbits, two boffins and a bolger, who were knocking holes in the walls of one of the cellars. Frodo also had a tussle with young Sancho Proudfoot. Old Odo Proudfoot's grandson, who had begun an excavation in a larger pantry, where he thought there was an echo. The legend of Bilbo's gold excited both curiosity and hope, for legendary gold, mysteriously obtained if not positively ill-gotten, is, as everyone knows, anyone's for the finding, unless the search is interrupted. When he had overcome Sancho and pushed him out, Frodo collapsed on a chair in the hall. It's time to close the shop, Mary. He said, Lock the door, and don't open it to anyone today, not even if they bring a battering ram. Then he went to revive himself with a belated cup of tea. He had hardly sat down, when there came a soft knock at the front door. <sighs> Nobili again, most likely, he thought. She must have thought of something really nasty, and I've come back again to say it. I can wait. He went on with his tea. The knock was repeated, much louder, but he took no notice. Suddenly, the wizard's head appeared at the window. If you don't let me in, Frodo, I shall blow your door right down your hall and out through the hill, he said. Uh, my dear Gandalf, uh, half a minute, cried Frodo, running out of the room to the door. Come in, come in. I thought it was Lobelia. Well, then I forgive you, but I saw her some time ago, driving a pony trap towards Bywater with a face that would have curdled new milk. She had nearly curdled me, honestly. I nearly tried on Bilbo's ring. I longed to disappear. Don't do that, said Gandalf, sitting down. Do be careful of that ring, Frodo. In fact, it is partly about that that I have come to say a last word. Well, well what about it? What do you know already? Only what Bilbo told me. I've heard his story, how he'd found it and how he used it. On his journey, I mean. Which story, I wonder? Said Gandalf. Oh, not what he told the dwarves and put in his book. Said Frodo. He told me the true story soon after I came to live here. He said you had pestered him till he told you. So I had better know too. No secrets between us, Frodo, he said. But they're not to go any further. It's mine anyway. That's interesting. Said Gandalf. Well, what did you think of it all? If you mean inventing all that about a present, well, I thought the true story much more likely and... I couldn't see the point of altering it at all. It was very unlike Bilbo to do so anyway, and I thought it rather odd. So did I. But old things may happen to people that have such treasures, if they use them. Let it be a warning to you to be very careful with it. It may have other powers than just making you vanish when you wish to. I don't understand, said Frodo. <sighs> Neither do I, answered the wizard. I have merely begun to wonder about the ring. Especially since last night. No need to worry. But if you take my advice, you will use it very seldom, or not at all. 
At least, I beg you not to use it in any way that will cause talk or rouse suspicion. I say again, keep it safe and keep it secret. You are very mysterious. What are you afraid of? I am not certain, so I will say no more. I may be able to tell you something when I come back. I'm going off at once, so this is goodbye for the present. He got up. Uh, at once? Cried Frodo. Well, I thought you were staying on for at least a week. I, I was looking forward to your help. I did mean to, but I have had to change my mind. I may be away for a good while, but I'll come and see you again as soon as I can. Expect me when you see me. I shall slip in quietly. I shan't often be visiting a shire openly again. I find that I have become rather unpopular. They say I am a nuisance and a disturber of the peace. Some people are actually accusing me of spiriting Bilbo away, or worse. If you want to know, there is supposed to be a plot between you and me to get hold of his wealth. Some people, exclaimed Frodo. You mean Otho and Nobelia? How abominable. I would give the bag end and everything else if I could get Bilbo back and go off tramping in the country with him. I love the Shire, but I begin to wish somehow that I had gone too. I wonder if I shall ever see him again. So do I, said Gandalf, and I wonder many other things. Goodbye now. Take care of yourself. Look out for me, especially at unlikely times. Goodbye. Frodo saw him to the door. He gave a final wave of his hand and walked off at a surprising pace. But Frodo thought the old wizard looked unusually bent, almost as if he was carrying a great weight. The evening was closing in, and his cloaked figure quickly vanished into the twilight. Frodo did not see him again for a long time.